Over six decades have elapsed. Yet Errol Flynn, the globally renowned Australian actor from Hollywood's golden era, remains unforgettable. Best known for portraying both a cunning deceiver and a charismatic hero in historical action films such as Captain Blood and The Adventures of Robin Hood, Errol left an indelible mark in the 1930s and 1940s. Beyond his cinematic triumphs, his extravagant personal life and indulgent inclinations added to the compelling allure for audiences. To shed more light on their father's life, Errol's children have boldly spoken out today, revealing the details of all the secrets hidden throughout his life. Don't miss it. He professed that. During his adolescence, he faced allegations of homicide. Errol Flynn's early life in Tasmania laid the groundwork for the adventurous and rebellious persona that would later define his Hollywood career. Born on June 20, 1909, in Hobart, Tasmania, Flynn spent a significant portion of his childhood in this remote part of Australia. While he would ultimately achieve fame and stardom in the United States, his formative years were marked by defiance, controversy, and a penchant for living on the edge. As a young boy, Flynn displayed a rebellious streak, rejecting authority and challenging societal norms. His early experiences hinted at the charismatic yet tumultuous life that would unfold in the years to come. At the age of seven, Flynn's defiant nature manifested when he ran away from home after being punished for engaging in inappropriate activities with a young girl under the guise of playing doctor. By the time he reached 17, Flynn's rebellious behavior escalated, leading to his expulsion from school and involvement in an Australian gang. Even his own mother, in describing him as a devil in boys' clothing, foresaw the challenges that lay ahead. Flynn's self-styled narratives of his pre-Hollywood life, as recounted in various interviews and his autobiography, often blend truth with embellishment. He portrayed himself as a swashbuckling figure, at times a ship captain, a gold prospector, and even a trader. One of the more controversial aspects of his early adventures was his claim to have tricked indigenous people in New Guinea into working on plantations and then selling them into indentured servitude. These stories, however, must be approached with caution, as Flynn was known for weaving tales that blurred the lines between fact and fiction. According to Flynn's own recollections, during one of his journeys through New Guinea, he and his assistant found themselves under attack in the jungle. In a dramatic turn of events, Flynn asserted that he personally defended himself by injuring one of the attackers in the neck. He claimed to have been tried and acquitted for the incident, though the veracity of these events remains uncertain. Flynn's departure from New Guinea was hastened by the contraction of a severe case of gonorrhea. This health setback served as a catalyst for him to move on from the tumultuous life he had led in the region. Ultimately, these early escapades provided a foundation for the larger-than-life tales that would surround Errol Flynn, contributing to the mystique and intrigue that defined his Hollywood persona. Errol Flynn schemed his entry into Hollywood. Errol Flynn's journey into the world of acting was as unconventional as the adventurous tales that surrounded his early life. His initiation into the film industry was far from the glitz and glamour of Hollywood taking place in the exotic locales of New Guinea. While Flynn was captaining a boat on the Sepik River in New Guinea, fate intervened in the form of a film titled In the Wake of the Bounty, being shot in Tahiti. The filmmakers, in need of additional footage, hired Flynn's boat for some B-roll shots. Little did Flynn know that this seemingly incidental encounter would be the catalyst for his entry into the world of cinema. During the shoot, Flynn's charismatic presence and swashbuckling demeanor caught the eye of an executive involved in the production. Recognizing in Flynn the perfect type for the role of Fletcher Christian, the executive saw potential in this unassuming boat captain. While In the Wake of the Bounty wasn't the film that catapulted Flynn to stardom, it did plant the seed of ambition in him, the desire to become an actor. During this period, Flynn's personal life added an intriguing layer to his narrative. It is believed that he was romantically involved with a wealthy older woman. 
In a daring move, Flynn reportedly stole and sold some of her jewelry to finance a trip to England. The journey, according to Flynn, though his stories were often embellished, took him on a roundabout route filled with startling adventures, spanning from Hong Kong to the Philippines. As detailed in You Must Remember This, Flynn's audacious journey took an unexpected turn when he conned his way into a British theater company. Posing as a major star in Australia, he provided the company with a list of impressive credits, all of which were fabricated. This audacious move led to Flynn's casting in a Warner Brothers murder mystery being filmed in London. The success of his role in the London production quickly caught the attention of Hollywood. Flynn's charisma, rugged charm, and natural screen presence prompted an invitation to Tinseltown. Thus, Errol Flynn's Hollywood career was set in motion thanks to a chance encounter on the Sepik River and a series of audacious moves that characterized his life both on and off the screen. His initial matrimony was tumultuous and marked by violence. Errol Flynn's arrival in New York in 1934 marked the beginning of a new chapter in his life, one filled with both professional opportunities and tumultuous personal relationships. His journey across the Atlantic, as detailed in his autobiography My Wicked Wicked Ways, was a captivating adventure in itself, featuring a cast of notable characters among his fellow passengers. Among those sharing the voyage were famous stage actors, a Russian princess, and a French film star named Lily Damita. Little did Flynn know that this chance encounter would lead to a significant and, at times, turbulent chapter in his life. Lily Damita, who would later become Flynn's first wife, initially did not respond favorably to his advances. According to Flynn, when he asked her to dance, she coolly replied, Perhaps. Come back later. However, Fate had other plans for the budding romance. Upon reaching Hollywood, Errol Flynn and Lily Demita found themselves drawn to each other, sparking a whirlwind romance. Their marriage, chronicled in a biography by Tony Thomas, spanned seven years, but it was far from a blissful union. The couple's frequent arguments earned them the nickname The Battling Flynns, reflecting the intensity of their disputes. Reports suggest that their struggles extended beyond verbal disagreements, often turning physical. Flynn would arrive on film sets with visible injuries, purportedly inflicted by Demita hurling objects at him during their heated altercations. The volatile nature of their relationship became a source of concern both within and outside the Hollywood studios. One particularly dramatic incident occurred during their one-year anniversary party. Flynn's tardiness prompted Demita to throw a bottle of champagne over his head, and in response, he reportedly struck her in the face, breaking her tooth. The aftermath of this violent encounter landed both of them in the hospital. Recognizing the potential damage to Flynn's public image, especially as a rising star, the studio intervened to cover up the incident. The official narrative portrayed their injuries as the result of a car crash, a story that emphasized Flynn's supposed heroism in swerving to avoid hitting a cat in the road. This carefully crafted narrative shielded the true nature of the altercation and protected Flynn's reputation in the eyes of the public. The turbulent marriage of Errol Flynn and Lily Demita left an indelible mark on both their lives, shaping the narrative of Flynn's personal struggles amid his burgeoning Hollywood career. Their story serves as a poignant reminder of the challenges and complexities that often accompany fame and the quest for love in the tumultuous world of the entertainment industry. The body of his closest companion purportedly made an eerie appearance. The relationship between Errol Flynn and legendary actor John Barrymore was a unique blend of mentorship, camaraderie, and eccentricity that left an indelible mark on Flynn's life and Hollywood lore. John Barrymore, renowned for his brilliance in the silent film era, was not only celebrated for his acting prowess, but also infamous for his bohemian lifestyle and penchant for revelry. By the time Flynn entered Barrymore's orbit, the older actor's career had suffered under the weight of alcoholism, yet he remained an idol to the aspiring young star. 
After his tumultuous divorce from Lily Demita, Flynn sought solace in the company of John Barrymore, engaging in a lifestyle that mirrored the older actor's penchant for hedonism. Barrymore became a frequent guest at Flynn's house, leading to some unconventional conflicts. Barrymore's unrestrained behavior, including relieving himself out of windows and in the fireplace, added a touch of the absurd to their friendship. The bond between Flynn and Barrymore reached its zenith when Barrymore passed away in 1942. Flynn was reportedly devastated by the loss of his mentor and close friend. However, Hollywood lore contains a macabre twist to this tale, a ghoulish prank allegedly orchestrated by some of Flynn's famous peers. According to various accounts, including Flynn's own recollections, a plan was hatched to play a morbid prank on the grief-stricken Flynn. While some sources attribute the scheme to Humphrey Bogart and Peter Lore, Flynn claimed in his autobiography that it was Raoul Walsh, known for his roles in The Birth of a Nation and directorial work on films like White Heat, who masterminded the macabre joke. The prank involved concocting a false story about being a friend of Barrymore's aunt and paying an undertaker $100 to borrow the actor's body. Walsh and his accomplices surreptitiously transported Barrymore's corpse to Flynn's residence and positioned it in a chair. The inebriated Flynn, returning home, was greeted by the sight of the supposedly deceased Barrymore. The shock was so intense that Flynn purportedly fled his own house, prepared to drive away before the pranksters revealed the elaborate ruse. This darkly humorous episode, whether fact or embellishment, stands as a testament to the eccentricities and camaraderie that characterized Hollywood's golden age. The friendship between Errol Flynn and John Barrymore, though tinged with tragedy and prank, left an enduring impression on the enigmatic legacy of both actors. He never entered the battlefield. Errol Flynn's notable absence from military service during World War II has been the subject of speculation and scrutiny, with various explanations offered to account for his non-participation in the conflict that consumed much of the world. Unlike many of his Hollywood peers, Flynn, known for his adventurous and swashbuckling screen persona, did not serve in the armed forces during this critical period. One common speculation, as detailed in You Must Remember This, suggests that Flynn's apparent indifference or fear may have contributed to his decision to avoid military service. Some friends, including his close companion David Niven, characterized Flynn as lacking loyalty and suggested that he didn't seem particularly concerned about the war. This perception fueled the notion that Flynn intentionally evaded service. At 33 years old, Flynn was still within the eligible age range for military service, but he was declared unfit for service due to health reasons. This decision, however, was met with suspicion and scrutiny. Some, including J. Edgar Hoover, questioned the legitimacy of Flynn's medical status, and there were suggestions that the studio may have influenced his exemption to retain their valuable star. Flynn's image as a beloved action hero contributed to skepticism about his purported unfitness for military duty. It was challenging for the public to reconcile the robust, adventurous characters he portrayed on screen with the notion that he was physically unfit for service. The suspicion that Flynn may have received preferential treatment due to his star status lingered in the public consciousness. Contrary to the suspicions and speculations, Flynn's medical conditions were indeed genuine and severe. Reports from the Los Angeles Times reveal a laundry list of health issues that contributed to his exemption from military service. These included a heart condition, recurrent malaria, chronic tuberculosis, multiple sexually transmitted diseases, STDs, and chronic pain. The severity and complexity of Flynn's health challenges were such that he sometimes collapsed while filming, further emphasizing the authenticity of his medical conditions. Errol Flynn's residence was a dwelling of perpetual revelry. Errol Flynn's residence on the renowned Mulholland Drive in the Hollywood Hills was not just a home. It was a legendary haven of extravagance and eccentricity. Described by the Wall Street Journal as part home, part casino, Flynn's estate reflected the flamboyant and unconventional nature of its owner. 
The house, perched on the iconic Mulholland Drive, boasted an array of unique features that mirrored Flynn's adventurous lifestyle. Hidden passageways, two-way mirrors, and peepholes were incorporated into the design, allowing Flynn to indulge in the intrigue of secretly observing his guests. According to Flynn, the guest list for his Hollywood abode was nothing short of eclectic and vibrant. Flynn's residence became the epicenter of a nearly non-stop Hollywood party, drawing in a diverse crowd that included his friends, fellow movie stars, and even strangers. The revelry was so intense that, as recounted by the Wall Street Journal, there were occasions when the sheer number of people milling around made it challenging for Flynn to navigate his way to the front door upon returning home. In his autobiography, Flynn vividly portrayed the motley crew of individuals who frequented his residence. His guests, as he described them, were a colorful mix of pimps, sports, bums, down-at-the-heel actors, gamblers, athletes, sightseers, process servers, phonies, queers, salesmen, the famous and the infamous, stars, bit players, stuntmen, and artists. The diverse and eclectic gatherings mirrored the dynamic and multifaceted world of Hollywood during that era. He asserted that women were irresistibly drawn to him. Errol Flynn's unabashed claims of irresistible allure and an endless stream of female admirers permeate the pages of his autobiography, where he paints a vivid picture of his romantic escapades. According to Flynn, the Mulholland House, his residence on the famous Mulholland Drive, became a magnet for women who pursued him with relentless determination. In his own words, Women banged on the doors of Mulholland House like ice drops in a hailstorm. I had to bolt the doors against them. I had proposals of marriage every day. Throughout his life, Flynn adopted an unapologetic stance when it came to accusations of wrongdoing in his romantic and sexual exploits. He often portrayed himself as a passive participant, deflecting responsibility for any perceived transgressions. As revealed in You Must Remember This, Flynn once explained away his well-known infidelity by suggesting that if an attractive woman entered his dressing room and initiated intimate contact, he considered himself blameless. If I'm sitting in my dressing room and a pretty girl comes in and pulls my zipper down, I'm not doing anything. I didn't touch her. Flynn's reputation as a charismatic womanisseur was so entrenched that it gave rise to the idiom in like Flynn, a colloquial expression suggesting swift and effortless success, particularly in matters of romantic conquest. The phrase became synonymous with Flynn's own purported ease in winning over women. The apex of Flynn's notoriety in the realm of romance occurred in 1942 when the details of his sex life were thrust into the public eye during a highly publicized trial. This legal scrutiny cast a spotlight on Flynn's personal affairs, revealing a side of the actor that went beyond his on-screen swashbuckling persona. The trial further fueled the public's fascination with Flynn's tumultuous personal life and added a layer of scandal to his already enigmatic image. Errol Flynn wed a youthful woman employed at the courthouse. Errol Flynn's post-trial narrative, as presented in his autobiography, reveals a man who felt victimized by what he deemed a political whirlpool, with both himself and the girls who had accused him as participants caught in its vortex. This narrative, presented as a larger societal issue, set the stage for Flynn's unapologetic continuation of his controversial romantic pursuits. The trial's outcome did little to dissuade Flynn from his interest in relationships with young women. Despite the potential legal repercussions, Flynn embarked on a new liaison, this time with Nora Eddington, a young woman he met while still facing the specter of legal consequences. Eddington worked behind a cigarette counter in the courthouse lobby, providing a poignant backdrop to Flynn's audacious romantic pursuits. Throughout the trial, Flynn openly admitted to keeping a watchful eye on Eddington. This revelation, coupled with his candid acknowledgement of being concerned about the possibility of imprisonment, underscored Flynn's cavalier attitude toward societal norms and legal consequences. His hope for one last fling during this tumultuous period exemplified a man seemingly undeterred by the gravity of his circumstances. 
Flynn's legal fate diverged from the possibility of imprisonment. Despite admitting to breaking the law, the repercussions seemed minimal, adding to the mystique surrounding his life. As quoted by Vanity Fair, Flynn boldly declared, I might have been guilty, under the law that is, but everybody knew that the girls had asked for it, whether or not I had my wicked ways with them. This statement encapsulated Flynn's defiance and his belief that public opinion, shaped by his charismatic persona, held more weight than legal verdicts. The aftermath of the trial marked a continuation of Flynn's life characterized by controversy, audacity, and a refusal to conform to societal expectations. His ability to navigate through legal challenges while maintaining his public image contributed to the complex legacy of Errol Flynn, leaving an indelible mark on the narrative of Hollywood's golden age. He grappled with the anguish of depression and the clutches of addiction. The trial, despite being a media spectacle, seemed to have little impact on the adoration fans felt for Errol Flynn. The accusations of taking advantage of teenage girls did not significantly alter the public's perception of their idol. However, for Flynn himself, the trial took a toll, leading to a series of personal and professional challenges that would shape the latter part of his life. The stress of the trial exacerbated Flynn's already heavy drinking habits, leading to a dangerous escalation in his substance use. In addition to alcohol, Flynn began experimenting with drugs, a coping mechanism that further fueled his downward spiral. Reports indicated that Flynn was frequently seen receiving vitamin injections, often laced with morphine, reflecting a pattern of self-destructive behavior. As chronicled in Errol Flynn, The Spy Who Never Was, Flynn's film career faced significant challenges during this period. His star power, once synonymous with swashbuckling action roles, was waning. The stagnation of his career, coupled with the emotional weight of the trial, plunged Flynn into a severe state of depression. He felt the studio was pigeonholing him, limiting his roles to those of an action hero, but attempts to cast him in different genres resulted in box office disappointments. Critics, once enamored with Flynn's charismatic performances, turned harsh delivering unfavorable reviews. Financial struggles added another layer of stress, marking the first time since becoming a movie star that Flynn faced economic hardships. The confluence of personal and professional challenges created a perfect storm that impacted his mental and physical well-being. Flynn's reputation for excessive drinking became a warning for directors hired to work with him. Despite these warnings, Flynn continued to find ways to indulge in alcohol on set. One unconventional method involved injecting alcohol into oranges, which he would consume during filming. This clever yet alarming strategy highlighted the extent of Flynn's dependence on alcohol. Within a few years, Flynn's struggles extended to heroin addiction, further complicating his personal and professional life. His behavior on set became increasingly difficult, straining relationships with colleagues and leading to clashes with Warner Brothers. The long-standing partnership between Flynn and the studio eventually came to an end, marking a significant chapter in the actor's turbulent journey. After his death, allegations emerged, suggesting his involvement as a Nazi spy. The intriguing and controversial theory that Errol Flynn was secretly a Nazi spy emerged in 1980, courtesy of biographer Charles Hyam. Hyam's suspicion was sparked by the political affiliations of some of Flynn's associates, leading him to delve into the actor's connections, particularly with individuals who had ties to the Nazi party. One notable figure in Flynn's circle was Dr. H. F. Urban, an Austrian doctor and member of the Nazi party, whom Flynn had befriended in New Guinea. Despite Dr. Urban's admission that German intelligence had approached him to establish a Shanghai Nazi spy ring, he never explicitly confessed to being a Nazi spy. Another controversial acquaintance was Freddie McEvoy, a close friend of Flynn's described as an anti-Semitic Nazi sympathizer. Charles Hyam claimed that, during his research, he received confirmation from an individual whose husband had worked closely with Flynn 
According to this account, Flynn allegedly divulged, while under the influence of alcohol, that he was covertly working for the Nazis. This revelation added a layer of intrigue to Flynn's already complex life story. However, the theory put forth by Hyam faced significant scrutiny and challenges. The 1990 book titled Errol Flynn, The Spy Who Never Was, refuted many aspects of Hyam's claims. It highlighted that while Flynn did have connections to Nazi sympathizers, there was no concrete evidence proving he was a spy for the Nazis. As detailed in You Must Remember This, Flynn's associations with individuals linked to the Nazi party are confirmed. It is apparent that he was acquainted with people whose political leanings aligned with the Nazi regime. However, the leap from association to active espionage remains unsubstantiated. In the twilight of his existence, Errol Flynn produced some of his most poignant work. Errol Flynn's career took a dramatic turn after the commercial failure of his film, The Adventures of Don Juan. Once celebrated as a charismatic action hero, the studio deemed him more trouble than he was worth. In the aftermath of this setback, Flynn found himself relegated to working abroad or in television, facing a significant decline in the types of roles he was offered. In an attempt to revive his career, Flynn ventured into co-financing his own film, hoping for a triumphant comeback. However, this endeavor turned disastrous when the production ran out of funds, leading to the cancellation of the shoot. Financial ruin soon followed, exacerbated by an enormous tax bill that Flynn had no means to pay. Forced to take on small roles simply to make ends meet, Flynn's once-flourishing career had hit a nadir. As highlighted in You Must Remember This, this downturn in Flynn's professional fortunes paradoxically became a catalyst for what some consider the finest work of his career. Having long struggled against being typecast, Flynn found himself cast in emotionally complex roles only after falling out of favor with the studio. These roles offered a departure from his earlier image, allowing him to explore new facets of his acting abilities. In 1957, Flynn portrayed the character of Mike Campbell, an exciting, debt-ridden, and frequently intoxicated war veteran in the film adaptation of Ernest Hemingway's novel, The Sun Also Rises. The role, both funny and tragic, provided Flynn with an opportunity to delve into more nuanced and challenging territory in his acting career. The character's struggles mirrored aspects of Flynn's own life, marking a departure from the swashbuckling hero roles he had become synonymous with. Continuing on this path of exploration, Flynn took on the role of his old friend, John Barrymore, in the film Too Much Too Soon. This adaptation of Barrymore's daughter Diana's memoir allowed Flynn to embody the complexities of a character whose life echoed his own. The film delved into Barrymore's turbulent life, offering Flynn the chance to showcase his acting prowess in a role that had clear parallels to his personal experiences. What do you think about the tragic truths of Errol Flynn? Leave us your comments in the section below. We hope you have found this helpful video. Don't forget to leave a like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you like it. Thank you for watching this and see you in the next videos. Goodbye.